Uh, welcome everybody to this Africa session of ECFR's ACM. This is a breakout session and we're focusing here on climate in the African context. Um, the title of the session gives you some idea of where we want to go. It's a little bit of a leading title, really. We're talking about how the climate transition and the green transition in Africa can be best realized. Um, joining us on the panel today, we're very lucky to have sort of a full spectrum of expertise. We have Foreign Minister Pekka Havisto joining us from Finland, who will give us a foreign affairs view on the issue. Uh, Remy Roux, the CEO of the French development agency, AFD, coming with a development perspective. And then with another development perspective, we're also very lucky to have Anya uh, Langbucher with us, who is representing the Gates Foundation, um, which needs no introduction in this space and is playing a very important role. Before I get into setting the scene, just a word of uh, appreciation as well to our partners. Uh, the Africa program at ECFR is new. It's emerged during the COVID period, and I don't think it would have emerged without the, the life-giving support that we've had from the Gates Foundation. So we'll thank you for your intellectual contribution here, um, but also to your partnership there. Um, and we have also to thank the Robert Bosch Stiftung, who is building on what we've begun with Gates and helping us go to the next level. Uh, before I, I turn over to Foreign Minister Havisto, just a couple of words about where I think we are right now in the climate issue in Europe, Africa, uh, and then a word about where we'd like to get to. Um, on the African side, I would say they're looking towards Europe and what's coming over the horizon in terms of climate with a degree of trepidation. And that trepidation, I think, is linked to the fact that the foreign policy aspect of our European Green Deal, of our vision for how climate can be pursued in a foreign policy way, has not been articulated completely. The things that have leaked out and then have been taken up in the imagination of people working on this in Africa are some of the more punitive elements some of the scarier parts of the, of the European Green Deal. So top of the list there is the CBAM mechanism. The CBAM mechanism stands for the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Briefly, that is seen as a sort of tax for things that are coming outside of the European Union. So in this case, being produced in Africa and then being sent in. I don't think that this is uh, intentional. I think that this is a product of oversight, that there's a gap in terms of how we have defined what the Green Deal means in foreign policy terms. I think it's quite natural as well. The Green Deal began here first in Europe. It was a product of discussion among the member states and the EU institutions. So it focused very much first on us here in Europe internally. Then when we looked abroad um, and started thinking about the foreign policy um, and geopolitical aspects of it, the first thing that rose to mind was the fact that we might have a green fortress within the EU if we didn't look at how Europe interacts with the rest of the world on climate. And that's where this carbon border adjustment mechanism, this climate tax uh, emerged from. What I think um, we need to do, and what would be helpful for us to do, and is again the title of this session, is think about a, a comprehensive vision of what partnership with Africa and other parts of the world looks like on climate. And when we think about that, um, the natural conclusion to come to is that it means more European investment and more European partnership with Africa. The reason that's the case is that when we're pursuing Europe's global climate objectives and looking to Africa, it's not about reducing emissions in the first instance in Africa. That is not going to change a great deal in terms of global emissions. So our climate objective with Africa needs to be something different. And I think there it's twofold. First, it should be about helping ensure that Africa's economies going forward in the future, as they grow and become bigger, do so in a green way. 
So if Africa isn't a, a major emitter now, globally speaking, let us also ensure that as it develops, it continues not to be a global um, emitter, but moves on a green trajectory. The second thing is also fairness, justice. Um, the global economy is going to change very radically through uh, adapting to climate. And Africa does not have the same advantages that we have in Europe or in other parts of the developed world. Um, we have the potential of near bottomless finance to help transform our economies. We will have strength in developing green technologies. We have a certain leg up um, in terms of this transition process. The global economy is going to change. Um, Africa will need to change with it if there's a European Green Deal or not. That's secondary. It's going to change anyway. But I think Africa is really looking now to Europe and trying to see, and also articulating, um, the need for a more comprehensive vision about where this partnership can go and how we can work together to help Africa transform. We don't have that right now. We need this kind of guiding North Star of, of a policy objective. And right now we have, in the absence of that, a focus a bit on the punitive side, a focus a bit on adaptation, helping African economies and countries deal with the negative consequences. But what we need is this positive agenda that talks about how are we going to work together? How's the partnership going to be a win-win for both sides? So that's as much as I want to say in terms of setting the table. Um, we're very lucky, as I said before, to have Foreign Minister Havisto joining us from Finland. Uh, Minister Havisto, with that, if I could, I'd like to give the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Theodore, and, and good to see you online and, and best greetings to everyone there and greetings from Helsinki. It is minus 10 degrees here, so it's we are a little bit freezing, but that's, this is normal winter now. Uh, maybe first a couple of words on, on our national perspective. How do we deal with the Africa issues nationally? And, and because this maybe gives an example, what is the debate also, I would guess, in most of the EU countries regarding Africa. We, we launched last year, last spring, um, this spring, an uh, Africa strategy where we maybe first time took Africa out of this box of the development cooperation and our, or, or continent of conflicts and, and started to look at it as a political partner, development partner, uh, investment partner, uh, a diplomatic partner on, on many issues. And it was, uh, and, and we also looked what is the whole, whole of society contacts to, to Africa, including our academic institutions, our universities and so forth. And actually we were really surprised in the foreign ministry how many, many kinds of contacts one country has to, to African institutions and, and African countries and so forth. And uh, I think it was a very, very promising start. And, and one uh, remarkable uh, component of that was, of course, African diaspora that is living in Finland and with all the knowledge and, and ideas and, and, and so forth. So we put all that together as, as a new uh, Africa strategy. And, and of course, the, our key principles there were the green economic growth and sustainable structural change, including digitalization. What more can we do for digitalization in, in African countries and, and how that could help also in, in, in development? Uh, uh, and uh, at the same time, when we took the climate perspective, of course, we hand in hand with the climate all the time are looking at the loss of the dramatic loss of biodiversity issues. And of course, even if you correctly said that uh, the uh, African continent is not a major emitter of, of uh, uh, greenhouse gases, the biodiversity question is there and, and the changes in the, in the environment that has to be taken very seriously. And then we look particularly, of course, the impacts of drought and, and, and all, all this, which is uh, also then influencing to, to migration. But it's, it's very important that we, we shouldn't, from the from European perspective, look Africa only from the point of view of migration. I was just in, in Barcelona in this uh, Euro-Mediterranean uh, discussion with Mediterranean Union, and, and I, I think the particular Northern African countries are so tired when we always raise only migration as a, as a component, what, which concerns us, and I, I think that's, that's not fair, uh, looking the whole uh, magnitude of issues where we can cooperate with the African uh, continent. And we at the same time, uh, when we look our 
businesses and, and private sector actually we, we have a, a lot of uh, in, innovations and ideas which could be implemented very well on the African uh, context but still we have on the private sector a lot of uh, uncertainty linked to Africa the, the difficulty to find partners the difficulty to find the uh, right institutions to cooperate with and I, I think there that is something that we should really really uh, in, in invest uh, more um, then maybe one one of the issues that of course comes always up is is the conflicts and environment interlinkages uh, between these I've been working as you know in in Sudan and in, in Liberia on, on, on conflict and environment topics and of course uh, there we could do more together also to for green recovery in in, in some of these uh, areas and I, I I think that could be one of the uh, one of the projects with that EU uh, and African Union could do together um, of course as a whole uh, I think European Union is also looking to the African continent with the, with the new eyes and, and and that is that is positive and I think the, the the approach has been changed in the in the last years but of course we have this uh, uh, national plans country uh, it's it's country doing their own plans and then the, the EU EU uh, acting as a whole and, and and this is maybe still not always very well uh, coordinated on the climate issue something that where we have also been approaching African countries we have we have uh, formed this kind of uh, uh, coalition of finance ministers against the climate change and actually we have now more than 60 finance ministers in the network and and it, it was it, it's very interesting because actually so many finance ministers are interested on climate issues and understand that this has more to do or, or at, at least as much to do with the finance ministers as with the environmental ministers and I think that kind of network should be should be also uh, encouraged and, and uh, established in the future and then maybe my final uh, you, you took the perspective of justice uh, climate justice up and, and of course when looking the demography of uh, African continent and the young generations coming up young people who need the jobs and, and who who deserve green jobs in, on their own continent and where we could do cooperation I think that that's one of our key challenges and I'm happy to cooperate on, on those issues I will finish here and then we have maybe more time for discussion thank you yeah, we see just from a few of the examples that you listed um, how difficult it is to maybe set one single overarching priority for climate. It has, it's so multifaceted. Um, I'm, I'm sure uh, Remy from Paris will uh, expand on this uh, and enrich the discussion with further aspects. So Remy, if I could, I'll give the floor over to you. Thanks a lot, Theodore. Can you help me? Can you hear me well? I hear you very well. Excellent. Thanks a lot. And um, it's, a, it's a great honor to share this panel with, with you, Minister, and with, uh, with Anya. Uh, I, sh I should have been in, uh, in Berlin. I'm, I'm sorry for that, <laughs> for my, my first uh, annual meeting of uh, ECFR since I'm, I'm a new member, I'm a newcomer. Uh, so sorry for that. But uh, uh, it's for a good reason, because I was in, uh, in Brazzaville and in Kinshasa uh, since uh, last Sunday. So I can <laughs> give you uh, fresh news on the, on the forest uh, front <laughs> in Africa and on, on, on climate consciousness and uh, awareness and, um, and resolve uh, by uh, our African uh, colleagues. Uh, because, of course, uh, it's for me absolutely obvious that uh, our two regions, uh, Europe uh, and Africa, um, are so connected uh, that they have to join to join forces, and I, and I, of course I'm um, I'm speaking uh, from the perspective of um, uh, the agency, the, the public bank I'm heading, which is called uh, AFD, uh, Agence Française de Développement, uh, which is the the oldest in the world, actually born. Uh, uh, December the 2nd, 1941, so we, we turned 80 uh, last week, uh, born in London actually, uh, founded by General de Gaulle uh, at the heart uh, of, it was not a, about colonialism, it was uh, really about resistance, about uh, 
the fight at the heart of uh, World War II when uh, Africa actually liberated France, its army as well as its uh, financial forces. So uh, I love to see my institutions I, as being uh, by the African side. Uh, of course, and bringing back uh, lessons, forces uh, from Africa to France and, uh, and, and Europe. And we are heavily invested in, in, in the continent. A AFD weighs 12 billion euro investments each year. Uh, half of it is in Africa and half of it is for direct positive uh, impact on, on the fight against climate change. So that, that's the perspective I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from. And also as the chair of uh, the IDFC and uh, um, uh, very active in the financing common movement with the 530 public development banks in the world that are sensors of uh, uh, climate change and, and what we can do on the public investment side. Uh, everywhere in the in in the world, and and there are 100 uh, public development banks in Africa that are very very active and conscious of the challenges ahead. Um, of course, there's a, there's a, we are in a in a difficulty right now, as you know it, uh, because uh, our African colleagues, um, I mean they feel uh, this disrespected uh, and sometimes punished by the rest of the world and maybe for those of you probably yourself ministers other that i was in glasgow uh, and and you know that uh, african leader, leaders and delegation they came out of uh, of glasgow uh, really upset really upset uh, and probably we will uh, hear from them uh, in a few weeks. And uh, of course, under the French presidency, uh, Clément Beaune, uh, I think, will intervene tomorrow. President Macron at a press conference uh, this afternoon. Uh, well, we will uh, chair the <laughs> the uh, EU EU summit, and so we have to we have to prepare for strong remarks uh, from Af African heads of state um, about. Um, unfulfilled promises. Uh, uh, I mean, the 100 billion uh, euro from Copenhagen should have been closed by Glasgow. Um, and you know, we are in Africa next year uh, in Sharm el Sheikh uh, for COP27. So we, we, we preferably have to close it by then. <laughs> uh, and, and this issue of loss and damage that came so strong in the discussion in Glasgow is a direct consequence from the 100 billion. And it's and it's a it's a different uh, it's it's beyond mitigation and adaptation loss and damage. It's really uh, minister is true. It's really about climate justice, and this issue was uh, somehow under under the radar in the negotiations. And now they are at the heart of it, and that's a signal. Certainly, we have to we have to to understand and we have to answer the yes the. The, the, the border, the, the carbon tax, the border mechanisms that, are, that we are envisaging for domestic reasons in Europe has also international consequences. And I, and I know that the, the way we are uh, framing this scheme will probably not have very concrete consequences from African economies. But I remember the debate about the, Euro, the, the EPA. You remember the, the Europe, the, 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 the the trade policy with Africa about 15 years ago, and it and and it was exactly the same. I mean, it had no consequences, but it was so badly perceived by African pet partners, including the case that we are telling them that it has no consequence because <laughs> their economies are too weak, and, and that it seems that we will forbid them uh, to develop uh, in the future. So I think we are we are to be very cautious on that because, of course. Uh, the international, um, I'm not, of course, putting into question that we have to, to do our Green Deal and, and, and transform our own economies for the sake of the whole planet. But please factor in uh, the diplomatic consequences uh, as soon as uh, possible. The issue of gas also will come very strong in the discussion because you know that all uh, uh, financiers, public financiers, including AFD actually and EIB, uh, 
uh, we said publicly in Glasgow that we will stop financing fossil 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 fuels uh, in Africa and, and, and everywhere. And so our partners are, are thinking this is unfair uh, because part of their trajectories will rely on fossil for a long time and because they have reserves. Uh, discovering new reserves uh, every year uh, in so many African uh, countries. So it's it's about the respect. Uh, we have to deal with that. My, my my next point is really if we succeed, and I think we will do it uh, at the political level of course, minister to ease uh, the discussion, then um, uh, just stress uh, the incredible potential of Africa for climate. Uh, and we should not underestimate what Africa can provide in this in this perspective. You, you know that uh, emissions are very low in Africa for now. Probably you don't know that emissions per capita are lower in 28, 2018 than they were 20 years before in Africa. And the continent has developed for the last 20 years quite significantly, a lot of growth. And so thinking of uh, climate as an issue for the future in Africa is totally wrong. I mean, so many African countries are already engaged in the transition. And you know the, 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 uh, the indices of African countries were quite significant in Glasgow. Uh, and we all know, and the minister better than I, that Africa is exemplary in the COP settings. I mean, remember what uh, Durban uh, in 2011 meant for climate. Remember what Marrakesh after COP21 to COP15 meant for uh, climate. And again, we will meet again in Sharm el uh, uh, next year. So they are doing a lot. They, they of, of course, have the uh, formidable opportunity to leapfrog, meaning, of course, the infrastructures are not yet built. And so probably when we have to uh, uh, reinvent uh, our old infrastructure, close our minds, do a lot of uh, very difficult things in Europe and elsewhere, I mean, Africa has the opportunity to start with a very efficient infrastructure uh, that are aligned and consistent with uh, our, our climate uh, goals. My last point is, uh, uh, to make it an opportunity, and I think I really think that this is uh, possible. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there are also the issue of deforestation, land use that are that is highly emitting. Uh, of course, so it's a it's a race I think between the positive investments and uh, what the population and the demographic surge in Africa will. Uh, a lot of expectation and a lot we can do uh, from Europe to build uh, this alliance for climate uh, between uh, our two regions. You know, we are doing a lot uh, between um, um, financiers with this uh, Team Europe spirit uh, uh, framework, procedures that we are progressively putting uh, in place under the guidance of the, of the Commission with uh, EIB, EBRD, and uh, so many uh, institutions from the member states that are more and more active uh, in Africa and connecting with their peers. Um, I think we certainly have to, uh, at a time and as soon as possible, go beyond ODA, please. I mean, mm. everybody's fed up with ODA, uh, our own uh, populations, and certainly uh, our clients in Africa. I mean, they see it as something... Uh, that is not respectful uh, and they want to turn to a narrative that is more about uh, sustainable development let's call it investments uh, a relationship that is more um, in terms of partnership this is the way the european commission now uh, names itself it's no longer about development it's about international uh, partnership and if we i think uh, ODA probably is, uh, is needed for very fragile settings. So we have to allocate highly concessional resources um, uh, in these uh, territories. But we have to use part of it. And this is what the Global Gateway is about. Uh, we have to use, use it to mobilize private finance. Way more
more than what we are doing because we are not doing it actually <laughs> and so uh, a lot of innovation can come including my institution so a lot of innovation can come yeah. from uh, what the position is uh, pushing for now uh, and um, let's do it uh, in africa first and foremost probably and i close only with that um, uh, what is happening in south africa is extremely interesting with this uh, just uh, transition policy, uh, President Ramaphosa and with so many partners uh, joining forces in this country and very important because just transition is uh, the catchword that uh, our Polish colleagues uh, uh, were the first uh, to put in the discussion and probably uh, South Africa will inspire our own uh, reconciliation between uh, environment and social uh, that is uh, uh, much needed to succeed uh, in a uh, uh, each and every uh, region in the world. Thanks. Thanks, Remy. Thanks so much. A few of the catchphrases that you sprinkled throughout your presentation about global gateways, infrastructure, how we partner, that's something I'd like to come back to um, after we've, we've heard from Anya, because that will take us towards where the title of this session was pointing us uh, originally. But Anya, sitting next to me, uh, the Gates Foundation, active all over Africa, huge footprint. Um, how are you seeing this issue? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and, and actually, I want to take up what uh, where Remy was um, ending a little bit with, with Global Gateways and the opportunities um, and, and also sort of the equal partnership. I think at this point, we should also maybe um, remember that at this point in time and coming out of COVID or not yet coming out of COVID, we're probably in an unprecedented situation of global inequality. And um, we still have vaccine coverages of about 4% throughout the um, African continent. We have all of the countries that are struggling much more with economic recovery um, than wealthy countries because there are less reserves, there are less fiscal stimulus ability to do this, and we have 31 million people fallen back into extreme poverty because of that. So I think while um, traditional ODA, as, uh, as Remy was pointing out, is certainly not um, anymore the answer to everything. I think we also have to be clear that wealthy countries still bear a, a long um, way and have a big responsibility to still keep up their ODA levels to help um, for a more inclusive economic recovery, um, which um, we can globally hopefully drive um, uh, taking that. I mean, also throughout uh, the African continent, we, we certainly have a much larger problem with debt um, excess burden, um, which is something why um, in terms of thinking around innovative instruments that are currently being discussed, for example, around the SDR reallocation, mm -hmm. is something that I think wealthier countries should be open to uh, and thinking about as you know new instruments um, to help. And, and finally, the last point to say on that is, um, and, and this is also picking up, I think, um, on the opportunity where we are with Global Gateways. Infrastructure investments um, are, on the one hand side, for example, um, we, we've seen again a large inequity around um, vaccine manufacturing, to take an obvious example that I think is in everyone's mind. And because we didn't have manufacturing capacity throughout the continent or not sufficient, and it was just, just fill and finish capacity, we did have an exacerbated global equity problem because of that. So thinking about what these infrastructure investments should look like and what health infrastructure investments, for example, would need to accompany um, um, you know, an agenda that Global Gateways is trying to fill mm. on the connectivity side of things, I think is incredibly important because we do need investments in what we call human capital, which would be health education, we have seen successes, we have seen that we've halved under five child mortality, but we're also seeing how fast we can slip back. And we've seen success in an education, but now we need to go the next step and we, we shouldn't allow now falling back. So I think the opportunity um, and coming back to the, um, to the idea around what change we can drive and Europe can drive through global gateways, I think is really to articulate a comprehensive policy and really one that um, covers and brings together the ideas on the green 
deal and what Africa's role can be in that and what it can mean for that, but really, really try to have for once an, an con sort of a comprehensive agenda that picks the different um, uh, picks up the different items and brings them together in, in a policy that makes sense for the whole of Europe, which very often, I think the risk of the past has been that's been very disjointed. Mm -hmm. And um, as we're looking to financing instruments, I, I agree that we should be looking into much more instruments than just pure ODA, but we should also be clear that some elements, and health is one of them, we will still need to have a large amount of grant financing um, to just simply yeah. cover these needs, um, which I think we are seeing have been um, a reason for struggling. With regards to, um, um, I completely agree with all the points being made that um, we obviously um, have a very strong and important mitigation agenda, um, I think, ahead of us. And um, it was really interesting to hear um, also Rimi mentioning about the climate justice, which, which I totally agree with, is a is a really big issue going uh, going forward, and um, and one that I, I don't think we have an answer to at this point in time. I do want to also um, just also flag that adaptation is still a while. Um, we all agree that mitigation and, and new climate um, saving technologies are, of course, the most important things to think about. We also do know that we will have a rise in temperature between 2 and 3 percent, no matter what we do at this point in time. And we will have likely adaptation costs that will be doubling in the next 10 years. I think the estimates are about 500 billion by 2050. So, mm. and who will be against hardest hit by that is, of course, the poorest country that are the least contributors, um, especially women that are very strong um, by the labor force um, in agriculture um, across Africa are going to be one of the hardest hit of that problem. And well, we shouldn't be only talking about uh, migration. I hear that. I mean, but but there are estimates that um, we will have. Um, up to 143 million um, climate-related refugees is something that the World Bank's put out, which I think in itself is um, is something for us to all remember that we should also, in parallel, complementary need on on adaptation um, measures. Which, um, you know, we we do have new tools, and we have, and again here, you know, of course, as a foundation, we always think that a lot of the Solutions lie in more research and, um, um, and, and more innovation. So I'm also not giving up on that hope that um, if we invest more um, in new technologies that can be adapted and um, which we can do in an inclusive way together with African partners, because these technologies need to be ready for adaptation, implementation, application in the countries, um, then hopefully this is something that we can also not forget when we drive forward, hopefully an integrated agenda between global gateways and um, uh, the Green Deal. Well, that's a perfect handoff. That's uh, that's actually where I want to go go to next. So thank you for that. I wanted to put a proposition uh, to the room and also to the panelists um, to check with you and see if we're thinking about this in the right way. Um, my my thesis on this is that we've we've unnecessarily divided two uh, European policy initiatives that actually can combine and create um, a, a whole greater than the sum of its parts. So we have the European Green Deal on one side, and we have global gateways on the other side. We've heard uh, Remy and, and others here today talking about the necessity to invest in infrastructure. Uh, and we also know that the, the future of Africa's economies is going to need to move in a green direction, European Green Deal or not. That's just a global trend. So if we're thinking about these, uh, about these trends and we're looking at the concept behind these two initiatives, the European Green Deal and Global Gateways on the other side, I think that they are both aiming towards the same thing and we should actually combine them, at least in the African context. The future of, of green, so of applying the European Green Deal in Africa, will be investment in the new kinds of infrastructures. So the leapfrogging, the next phase in Africa's economic development. That's the kind of infrastructure we'll need. On the global gateway side, we're also talking about infrastructure. We're, we heard today from other speakers, we're looking at what kind of offer the EU and Europe can make that is not in competition with China's Belt and Road Initiative, that kind of infrastructure project, but is offering a European alternative to it, 
another vision to it. If you think about it in those terms, um, both initiatives are actually trying to go in the same direction. We can take that a step further as well. If we go outside of the EU context and we go towards the G7 and the G20, we have Build Back Better World. Also a similar objective. It's also trying to look at how we can supply uh, infrastructure to the world, how we can have, in this case, the transatlantic offer. And so I think that there's yeah, perhaps there's an, there's an unnecessary siloing between these different initiatives. And when we're looking at trying to create a, a bigger European footprint, trying to sort of mass and accumulate the, the offer, the tools, the things that we can put on the table, I think would help if we start conceptually from a unified position. There's a third aspect here too, which nobody has brought up, but um, if we look at the future of Africa's economy, we have to also look at the rising population numbers and draw the inevitable conclusion that there will also be a growth in Africa's middle class. That means that there can be a positive self-interest on Europe's side in investing in these things. And we can mobilize our private sector and our investment tools as well. As Africa's middle class grows, this is a market that is growing. And this is something that should be very interesting for Europe. And that kind of paradigm would also help, I think, a lot change the tone of the dialogue, which is something that we desperately need going into the AU-EU summit, which hopefully we'll find um, will take place in February. If we can explain to our African partners that we are doing things not simply out of a, out of a motive of charity, out of this donor-recipient relationship, but because we have recognized that we have interests in Africa and that we can realize them together, I think that will be one of the most fundamental ways we can change the relationship. This is what I continue to hear from African partners um, when I'm engaging with them. I want to just take a moment, if uh, either you, Foreign Minister Havisto or, or Remy or Anya, if you want to pick up on that point. Um, if not, I have another question ready to go, and we can also look to the audience if anyone wants to jump in on the AU summit. Um, but I'm just looking to you first, uh, Minister Havisto. Yeah, please, come in. Well, yeah, thanks for this good, good uh, discussion, and thanks Remy and Anya for excellent interventions and, and, and good ideas, and, and particularly Remy. Uh, going in detail on, on this climate climate issue, um, you you mentioned the, other, the the Chinese component, and I whenever you you <laughs> deal with Africa, it's always this complaint: what is China doing? What is China doing? And so forth. And I'm I'm always turning it back to us: what are we doing? And what are we doing instead, or what are we doing doing in the in the countries where China is active? We should look more on our own action. Than what China is doing, and of course, China can also do something good. I think it's important to mention that when when China decided about uh, also on, on on coal power plants uh, uh, that they they will not support those abroad and, and so forth, it's very important for the climate. But but uh, that they also have been changing their line on on this issue, and and I have to say that on climate issue, we probably need even cooperation with China as we as we saw in the COP26 and 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 and, and in this dialogue and. and this is one one uh, topic, and the other what what can Team Europe can do together? I think, uh, Remy, you, you took it very uh, very much in your your speech that that this in this Team Europe spirit is not only the European institutions or financing institutions, but also individual member states. We can build it, it together and, and and cooperate even even better than now. Back to you. Thanks so much. Thanks to Helsinki. Remy, would you would you like to chime in here? And Fremy's frozen, frozen for a second. Yeah. Anne, did you want I to wait in? I, I can come in a little bit also on the on the investment side of things. I, I very much agree that obviously this has to be the goal going forward. That um, mm. you know, um, and and I think to an extent that's an ambition that that we've had or the global community had for some time. It's now, of course, taken on a completely different path. I think it's important we keep in mind. Um, 
what are the right financing instruments for what type of um, investments we're making, but also um, at the same time, what do we need to deliver as well in order to actually make this investment successful? Which are the right partners? What type of skill transfer do we have to mm. do? What kind of technical assistance do we need maybe in addition to just a pure investment? What kind of responsibilities do we give to the investors um, as, they, as they bring forward? And um, also, what, what type of risk are uh, we are asking our development banks um, or commercial investors to take on as they go ahead. So I think, um, again, when we look at the vaccine space, if we are supporting vaccine manufacturing on the continent, we have to make sure it succeeds. Yeah. And, um, and that comes with a lot of tech transfer and a lot of skills transfer. And what we don't want is create um, manufacturing capacities that, you know, are idle for, for large parts. So, so I think these are the things that's responsibility on us as we are trying to enhance and drive investments. We really have to make sure we're thinking about both the right financing instruments for these and how we need to package them to make sure they succeed. Because otherwise it's putting too much of a burden on our new partners. Can I can I pick up on that point because I think that's that's something interesting. It's something um, Remy is not there anymore, but we've been hearing from Paris in the spring and the fall. From there, I've been picking up that we need to maybe also break down the walls between our financing instruments. That we need to think about merging more, um, not having such strict kind of firewalls between the different things. Um, Maybe the Gates Foundation has a different view on that, but I was wondering if I could pick your brain a little bit. Do you think that we need to keep... Remy's back, yeah. I'll, I'll bring Remy in a second. Do we need to keep things separate? Each tool has its place, or do we need to break down the walls and try to merge them? And I'm sure Remy will have a, um, a very um, important view on this. I mean, m mine would be that I'm not sure it's, it's, it's necessarily breaking down. It's more using the entire tool set mm -hmm. that we have. And um, there is an important instrument now, the EFSD, which is a guarantee instrument, um, which sits with the European Commission with the idea to leverage a guarantee instrument for disbursements of relatively large funds crowded in, um, you know, by member states or by the European Investment Bank or also, of course, the IFD, for example. Mm. And so I think this is already enlarging a little bit, um, you know, our ability to use financing instruments. I, I do think we need to think about taking on more risk. And, um, um, and, and taking on more risk is being at the same time also the important, be at the same sort of, you know, um, um, sort of have more of a partnership idea as we are together in this. I think this is all so a very important signaling effect. If you are truly taking an equity risk um, together with a partner, that's a very different um, signaling effect, how much trust you're putting into a project than if you are having a highly secured, um, you know, loan that you're expected to, to be paid, paid back. Hmm. But again, in the I'm game. Sure Remy has a view, of course. Yeah, Remy, so we, I think you wanted to make a point before that, but we also just touched briefly on the question, do we have the right tools for, for lending, for investment, uh, ODA? Should we break down the walls between them, merge them to create a kind of greater whole? Um, if perhaps you have a view on that, also between the national authorities, between countries and the EU. And I think you wanted to make a point before, um, before the, the connection broke. So uh, I'll let you respond to both. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Theodore, and, and sorry for for the, the technical um, difficulty. Um, so I, I don't want to, in my initial comment, of course, to be to be unfair to unfair to Europe. Of course, we are we are the most generous region in the world. Uh, we did a lot for for vaccines. There's there's a bit of unfairness here as well, uh, and we are heavily. Uh, invested, attentive to what is happening in, in Africa, probably more than uh, any region in the world. And, and, co and colleagues in, in Africa, they, they know it. Um, and they're waiting for us probably to, to change a bit uh, the posture, change a bit uh, how we operationalize. Um, and then we can certainly uh, embark uh, in, a new, in, a new, in a new journey that could be extremely Positive at a time when, when you followed the the, the summit uh, in uh, Dakar with uh, between China and Africa, 
when you see Chinese uh, flows uh, reducing, actually, quite significantly, they did not respect what they pledged. And uh, well, we see it on the ground. Huh? I was in Lomé two weeks ago with Kunduns, uh, Ambroise Fayol, colleagues. Uh, we were asking uh, are the Chinese around and they're, they're less and less present than they were in the past. For basically, they stopped financing internationally for two years now. So maybe it will change, they will come back. Uh, and hopefully uh, we are trying hard to co-finance with, with them uh, in following the right uh, international standards. I don't know if we will succeed, but there's a moment of opportunity for Europe uh, that we have uh, to seize. And uh, certainly uh, we have the tools, uh, but really I come back to the, th to the, to the, the idea that uh, we need a new narrative uh, we, that uh, at the political level uh, will have consequences on the way we use these tools and articulate uh, all of them. Uh, I, I remember, uh, remind you that uh, in the Paris Agreement, uh, we um, made the transformation of, of the financial system an end in itself. There are three objectives to the fight against climate change. Adaptation, mitigation, and finance. Uh, so it's 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 not a mean to an end. It's an end in itself. Uh, working on the financial transformation and the deployment of uh, the financial system. And I really I'm really convinced. I, I respect ODA. I'm originating uh, most of the bilateral French ODA. I, I'm well. <laughs> the DAC, uh, the, the 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 DAC is here at OECD in Paris, but I really see more and more the ODA referential as something that is uh, preventing us from occupying the full space our institution could uh, could um, uh, deep, could uh, occupy. So we again we need two targets. We need one target for vulnerable settings maybe a, um, a smaller uh, set of countries, territories than what uh, eligible ADA, ODA countries are now, uh, as you know it. And we need a second target, which is not in place right now, about mobilization of other partners. And as long as our institutions and, and also the World Bank uh, uh, is not uh, guided by these two targets, uh, we will not make it, and somehow ODA is uh, is a bit uh, has become too unclear uh, uh, for that. And and I, I just close by saying that um, I, I'm, I'm, I slightly disagree with what Anya said uh, initially. Africa is not uh, in a situation of over indebtedness. Uh, it's it's not the case. I mean, uh, Africa is the region in the world that weighs the less debt compared to its GDP. Africa has a question of uh, governmental debt uh, in many countries, but the economies are not financed, actually. Uh, savings are not transformed into long-term investments. There are savings in Africa, but the, the institutions are not in place to transform it into uh, infrastructure. Um, and we have to find ways uh, to provide non-sovereign financing. The private sector, of course, the municipalities. I mean, Kinshasa is, is 17 billion people right now. It will be the biggest city in the world in 2030. Uh, and, and it has no real financial capacity as a municipality. This is completely wrong. This is not the way we financed our own development in, uh, in in Europe. We need public banks uh, active and pro providing complementary resources to what the private sector and the governments uh, can provide. And we need a vibrant private, private sector with uh, the tools uh, to uh, the risk incentivize that is our disposal because Europe is also the most innovative place in terms of what ODA could, uh, could provide. So, um, so my, basically my answer is we have the instruments, probably SDR uh, and carbon markets now that Article 6 uh, is in place uh, could be also very interesting uh, 
uh, resources uh, to uh, repay debts or to capitalize public banks or to do things that ODA uh, is not uh, able to, to do. Uh, so we have the tools. There's a huge debate uh, ongoing right now uh, at the international level. So please, let's uh, experiment, uh, make Africa a laboratory of what the world of uh, development finance is uh, is becoming under our eyes. And Minister, please, we need at a time, uh, maybe by uh, mid January, mid mid February in Brussels, to have a sort of uh, uh, political narrative and framework that helps our institutions to go strongly in that direction. And not only in Africa, actually, also beyond. Thanks, Remy. Yeah, we're just about at time, and and you anticipated my my last question, which I'll leave to either you, the minister, Anya, anyone who wants to take it up. Um, the question is, what do you think is is the one most important thing that uh, the EU and the member states need to advance uh, ahead of the AU EU summit? We have a bit of a game of numbers, vaccine doses, SDR, and other things, but I think Remy is on the right path talking about resetting or creating a new narrative. Um, but I don't want to pre-cook the answer. Perhaps one of you wants to jump in. Please, Mr. Avisto. Uh, if, if, I, if I may, uh, I think Remy touched, touched the, exactly the discussion that we are running currently also here in Finland, that how to get the money working most effectively towards those goals that we have agreed in Paris and other climate, climate meetings, and, and uh, how to use the ODA as a seed money, which would trigger the private investments and, and locally and, and globally and, and nationally. And, and we, we are not maybe yet there, but we can see the, the concepts in Netherlands or in Denmark, which are actually feeding to this direction. And, and as you rightly said, the ODA is a little bit old fashioned in many, many ways to, 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 to be used in such a modern goal as, as a climate goal. And, and how do we combine it with the private money so that it multiplies the efforts and so forth. It's, it's one of those very, very important things. And this is also very important for Africa because it could multiply the, the funds that we have for the climate issues. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mr. Avisto. Uh, Rami, Anya, last, last thought on that? Europe's, Europe's uh, the first thing on the to-do list for Europe ahead of the summit. Did you follow? Uh, yes, sorry, I have difficulty to, to listen. Maybe Anya can, can start? Or... No? I, I think lots of the ideas that we've raised here are, are obviously the right ones. So, um, so, so I do hope it's going to be what, what I think we all want, which is more a partnership. Um, mm. um, and, um, and, and so I, I do think giving a clear agenda on what the EU means with um, global gateways, yeah. I think will be really important um, so that it is also, um, it's good to hear that maybe it doesn't have to be maybe even a competition to um, uh, China, which I think would be a, probably more of a positive framing in that sense. But I think giving reassurance that there has been a lot of thought going into this and there is a plan how to execute that would be a great message coming out of that. That would be uh, desirably concrete. Uh, Remy, we'll give the last word to you. You've been hinting at the need for a new narrative. The, the question, if you missed it, was what do you think is the most important single thing that, that Europe needs to uh, accomplish or emphasize going into the summit with, uh, with the Africa? Uh, I, want, I want to come back to... Uh, 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 to demography, uh, the, the, the minister made the point uh, initially. Uh, well, we all know that uh, a, a quarter of the world's population will be African by, by 20, 2050. So probably a quarter of all uh, artists, of all uh, sports women, sportsmen, a lot of creativity will come from Africa. So um, uh, we, are, we are very serious, of course. We are very geopolitical. We are very... Uh, 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 thoughtful uh, ways, uh, more probably more direct uh, to connect with African youth uh, and connect the diasporas uh, between our two regions and start uh, providing, um, yes, a narrative of hope, uh, uh, an investment and uh, equality uh, between our two regions. So I don't know how to do it. Uh, we had a summit in uh, Montpellier uh, 
between uh, President Macron and young um, activists from Africa, it was extremely surprising. And we are in the process of uh, uh, taking, uh, drawing consequences from uh, what happened then and certainly uh, willing to share all European colleagues that are also uh, pursuing uh, and searching for this connection uh, between this uh, incredible force uh, that lies in uh, African youth and, and challenge and threat, maybe, if we do not find a way to, to cope with it. Okay, thanks very much, Rami. So there we have it. We'll hear um, if that new narrative is realized with some concrete details in the summit that hopefully will take place in February. Uh, I want to just give a, a big thanks to Minister Pekka Aviso, who joined us from Finland, uh, Remy Roux, head of the AfD from Paris, and Anja Langenbucher with me here in Berlin from the Gates Foundation. Thank you all very much.